focus our attention on, on Jesus as we move up into the Easter season. And uh, we're going to be uh, uh, looking at a number of statements uh, that Jesus made in the book of John. In the book of John, Jesus made a number of I am statements. Uh, he said that I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door or the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he also said that I am the true vine. And so these statements are all kind of what would be called metaphorical statements where Jesus is describing himself, giving understanding to who he is uh, by these phrases, I am, and then describing something. Now they can be both revealing and confusing at the same time. But I think it, it begins to show that, uh, that uh, Jesus was more than merely a man. He was a man, but he was also fully God as well. Because if I was to make these kind of metaphorical statements about myself, you would think that I had lost my marbles. Like if all of a sudden I was to say to you on a Sunday morning that I stood here and I said... I am the big cow. Come to me and you will always have milk. You know, you would probably look at me and go, what are you talking about? It would be kind of a funny statement. And so it's actually interesting that Jesus is able to say these statements. And I think the, the people who were there, uh, some who knew Jesus and knew what he was about, these statements were wonderfully revealing. But for those that were on the fringe, these statements would have been a little bit, whoa, what, what is he saying? Why is he saying these things? And so this morning, I think that we want, because we are kind of 2,000 years after Jesus, these statements can be incredibly revealing about who Jesus is and who Jesus can be in our lives. And that's where I'm kind of hoping that we can go over the next number of weeks, is, is that we're going to discover a new depth of, of our relationship with Christ by looking at some of these statements. Um, there's lots of debate that's out there um, about the phrase I am and what it, what it means. It, it, there are different... Uh, in the book of John, there are other phrases when John uses the phrase I am in his writing. And uh, some say that it could be because uh, in the Old Testament, when they were talking about God, uh, the name was I am. And, and whether or not Jesus was making a bit of a uh, prophetic statement at these points of when he was making these I am statements. Uh, maybe at other parts, but in these particular statements, probably not. These statements seem to be metaphorical in its description of Jesus much more than they are a de declaration of his, uh, that, that he was God. Uh, so just to, to get that out as, as kind of a little bit of a background. But today we want to look at one of those phrases. And so today we're going to be looking at, I am the good shepherd. Jesus talks about being the good shepherd. And so if you have your Bible, we actually used uh, one of the verses that's in this chapter, John chapter 10, for our Thrive series. And, uh, but it's in the context of these verses when Jesus is talking about the good shepherd uh, that he talked about uh, that the thief comes only to steal and destroy, but I have to come that you might have life and life to the full or life abundant. And so this is what Jesus says in John chapter 10. If you're looking at it, we'll be kind of looking at a number of verses in the chapter, but verse 11 to start off. Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He implies and he says that he is the good shepherd. The implication on the other side of this is that there are bad shepherds that are out there that there are those that are going to be we're going in contrary and they're going to be looking to kind of control your life and actually uh, john says and uh, or jesus says in john this is verse one anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief in a robber then he goes on and says this 
The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And so here's what he's doing is, is he's making a qualifying statement about what the good shepherd is going to do in your life and what the bad shepherd, or what they call the thief, or the robber, will come in and do in your life. And this is the same tactic. It's talking about your enemy, and it's talking about Satan. So this is what his goal is. is His goal is going to be to come to your life and to steal, kill, and to destroy. And it's the same tactic that Satan does all the time. He comes in to steal your joy. He comes to steal uh, your peace. He comes to steal your attention. He steals your loyalty. He steals all these different things from your life. And Jesus makes the declaration that he is the good shepherd. He's the one that's watching out for you, so much so that it says that he laid down his life for us. And so here we have that Jesus is the one who says he's the good shepherd. He's the one that you can turn to, and he's going to be the one that's going to protect your life, not harm your life. The other shepherds that are out there, ultimately their goal is to destroy. And so Jesus gives a very good picture of what he is doing in people's lives. Okay, now I have some really good news and some really bad news. Actually, most of it's bad. Most of it's bad news. Um, Jesus says that he is the good shepherd. So in this metaphor, who are the sheep? It's not complicated. We are. We're the sheep. Okay, so he's the good shepherd. The comparison is is that then we are sheep. That's the bad news. Because sheep are stupid. So basically, Jesus is implying in this that um, that maybe we're, we're, yeah, not the sharpest tools in the shed. Just for the record, record, this is the animal mentioned more than any other animal in Scripture. It is the most commonly mentioned animal. About 200 times in the Bible, sheep are mentioned. Dogs are mentioned 44 times. Uh, for you cat lovers, guess what? There's no reference to cats in the Bible. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so no, no, enough, no cat jokes. Actually, the only cat mention maybe is a lion. Um, you know, so if you, it's interesting. Ken Davis does some, if you ever want to uh, Google something really fun, uh, Ken Davis does this great talk called Super Sheep. And, and he talks about his, his life with sh- working with sheep. And, um, and he, uh, he talks about the fact that you know, he was kind of disappointed that he was being called a sheep because he said, you know, isn't there a better image that, you know, we can grab a hold of? He wanted to be a lion in the kingdom of God, you know, something better, something more fierce, something more, you know, strong. Anyway, but there is a scripture reference to a lion, uh, but it's, it's given to Satan. <laughs> so, and the Bible says Satan goes around and he roars like a lion. Craig Groeschel says that he says that that makes that there's a connection between Satan and cats, but I don't know. <laughs> I like cats myself. Bold is a lion, so yes. So there is there there can be a positive reference, but most of the time he compares us to sheep. Um, sheep are uh, some of the dumbest animals because they generally can't be trained very well. You can eat, train almost every other animal, uh, but you really can't uh, train a sheep. And so there are some other things that we find out about sheep is, is that, uh, number one, sheep get lost easily. Uh, that they just kind of like wander off. Kind of like a toddler, you know. Uh, I, I've had this with... Uh, I mean, anybody lost a toddler at the mall or something like that? Uh, my wife still reminds me that I lost Rachel the one time uh, that I lost her at the mall. She just toddled off, you know, and uh, boy, I, I, boy, did I hear about that one for a while. <laughs> no, that's for sure. Um, and it's actually interesting because when it talks about sheep, there's even a scripture that talks about in Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. 
So it seems that that's a natural sheep thing. We just seem to wander around and get lost, and that's what we do. You know, Jesus uses another illustration. What does he do? He leaves 99 sheep to do what? Find the lost one, because, well, sheep get lost. That's what they do. And uh, there's a profound uh, line from a hymn. Um, um, oh, what's the hymn? I, I know the line. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave. God. Come thou fount of every blessing. Uh, you know, he, he says the line, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That seems to be our natural tendency. And I think it's one of the reasons why Jesus uses the sheep illustration is because we just have this tendency of wandering away. You know, here you have in stories in Scripture, um, God miraculously delivers the people of Israel. He takes them out of Egypt. And what do they do? They, they, they reject him and they think, oh, God's not going to lead us. God's not going to do this for us. You know, and so what happens? They end up wandering in the desert for 40 years. 40 years of wandering around. So sheep get lost easily. Sheep are generally defenseless. Um, you know, almost everything, every animal has some kind of defense system. You know, a snake has fangs. Um, you know, a bull has horns. It, most animals have some kind of defense system. I think the only thing a sheep can do is maybe butt you. Um, if you anybody been butted by a sheep before? Um, yeah, they'll, 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 they'll butt you every once in a while. Uh, but, but they really don't have much of a, of a defense system. Again, Ken Davis uses this illustration because he was bending over and they had this one sheep named Herman. And, and Herman butted him through a fence. Now, this is really interesting. So what happened was is that he decided that he was going to get Herman back. And so he hid around the corner when Herman came by and he actually jumped out and, and went, bah! And scared, and scared Herman. And guess what happened to Herman? He dropped dead. Just, <laughs> that was it. Like, you know, and that's, sheep are like that. Like, they just, when they get scared, they just fall over dead. <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, that may, may not be the best defense tactic that you've got going for you. And generally, uh, sheep need a shepherd. Because without a shepherd, uh, they are, are defenseless. You know, uh, David was a shepherd, and uh, at one point, you know, he's killing lions, he's killing bears, you know, he's killing all these animals to protect the, and that's why they carry the, um, there's a couple reasons why they carry a, a crook with them. Well, one is because they can, <laughs> which we're going to talk about in just a second, pulling sheep out of things. Uh, the other is it was a weapon because they needed to protect the sheep. Sheep are defenseless. The other thing that we find out about sheep is that sheep are very, very stubborn. Uh, they will just keep doing what they're doing. And so let's say there's two rocks that are there and they get themselves jammed and wedged in between these two rocks. Now, most of us would think to ourselves, maybe I should back up. This is, I'm, okay, I'm going to give you bad joke warning coming, okay? You know, but it's like, you know, they don't have, a, sheep don't have a backup, bleat, 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 horn. <laughs> Okay, that was the bad joke. That was bad. Sheep are very stubborn. And so what will a, sh a sheep in this situation, if they get themselves jammed between the rocks, what they are, what, guess what they're going to do? They're going to keep moving ahead, and they're going to get themselves jammed even harder and further in that. They're just, they just will not. And so if they're wandering away, well, they might, because they get lost easily, you know, that whole idea of let's retrace our steps and go back, no, we'll just keep going, keep going, wherever we're going, must be going somewhere. And so sheep just are generally stubborn. They'll just keep doing a wrong thing until, and, and they will do dumb things. Like, and, and sheep also will do things like, uh, oh, this is j just a general dumb thing. They'll get themselves turned on their backs. They can't get out. Uh, so they, they just are stubborn and they, and they do dumb things. Um, they also generally are pretty filthy. You know, most of the time we think of sheep being, uh, you know, kind of white and fluffy and those type of things. And, you know, and you've got your wonderful wool sweater that you've got on. 
Uh, but for the most part, they, they don't really do anything to keep themselves clean themselves. They'll just, you know, just get into the muck and the mire and ah, they'll just do that. And so this is the wonderful image that Scripture gives us that we are sheep. Yay! We are the sheep. We get, and, and, you know, but the funny thing is, is, is that when you begin to look at it, you can start to see it, don't you? How many of you have been doing something, and you know God doesn't want you to do that, but you, there you find yourself in the same place, doing the same thing. I, I have Chris Farley, uh, the Saturday Night Live comedian, uh, used to do this one talk show bit where he was, it was called the Chris Farley Show, and he would interview people, and he would say something dumb, and then he would go, oh, stupid, stupid, stupid. Have you ever found yourself doing that on your spiritual journey that you, you just go, oh, how could I have been so stupid to keep doing the same things again and again and again even though I know I shouldn't and I get drawn into the exact same things again and again? Well, Scripture tells us that part of, the, part of it is it's just because our sheep nature, that's what we do. But... The good side of this is this. Well, the bottom line is this. Number one, sheep need a shepherd. And number two, we need a savior. And so what does the, uh, the good shepherd do? In the time that we have the, together, I want to show you four incredible qualities of the good shepherd. And I pray that God would help connect these to our hearts and so that we can apply them to our lives every single day. Number one, he guides. Psalm 23, probably one of the most famous psalms, oops, says this, He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along right paths for His namesake. And so the Scripture reminds us that as the, the great shepherd or the good shepherd, that He leads us. John 10 says this in verses 3 and 4, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought us all his own, out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Scripture tells us that he is the good shepherd and that he guides us. And he guides us through his voice. And so we need to begin to, as his people, begin to know the voice of the good shepherd. We need to begin to try to discern his voice. I think I might try this as an experiment someday. I, I'm, I'm pretty confident I could pull this off. If you were to, maybe after, after service you're going to blindfold me and try this. If you were to take me, let's take all the women downstairs and you guys would just be downstairs and you guys would be talking together just talk amongst yourselves and then you blindfolded me and you put me in that room and you said to me go find your wife i'm pretty confident i could do it i'm pretty confident that in that situation under those circumstances even with 50 different voices calling out in the exact same room, I am pretty confident that I would be able to discern my wife's voice and to be able to find her. Why is that? Well, because she's yelled at me a lot. No. <laughs> because I am in relationship with Jen. And we have been in relationship for an extended period of time. And so even, it's funny because I've had this before where I am in the mall or something like that and I'm looking for her and I will stop. And, and if I know that she, because Jen's always knows people at the mall, and I will listen. And I often will find her just because I listen for her voice. That's what God wants us to be like with him, the good shepherd. To be in relationship with him so that when he speaks, we will be able to discern his voice. Uh, well, maybe we'll put it on you instead. Anyway, the, the point is, 
that we need to begin to try to discern God's voice. We need to listen and tune in to what he's saying. Now, some of it is uh, an awareness of his word. As we begin to know God's word, we begin to be better in tune with his voice. We also need to be in a better relationship with God's spirit. God's word tells us that his spirit lives in us and the Holy Spirit will give us leadings and promptings to do certain things. And as we are in relationship with him, we will be able to discern what his leadings and his promptings are more easily. So we are thankful that he is the good shepherd and that he wants to guide us. But how we do that is by being attentive and in a tune with his voice. goes on and he says that uh, he provides as well. This is verses 1 and 2. The Lord is my shep- shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters, and he refreshes my soul. Scripture tells us that as the good shepherd, he is going to provide everything that we need in order to be able to live a life of godliness. That he's going to give us everything that we need in order to be able to do that. Interesting to note is is that when uh, sheep don't lie down a whole lot, part of the reason is is because um, they are, um, they only will lie down when they are content. And oftentimes they're not content. Well, what makes a sheep content? Well, number one, they're well fed. Um, They're well watered. And they feel secure. It's interesting to note, he says, he makes me lie down in in, uh, green pastures. He leads them beside quiet waters. Why is quiet waters significant? Well, because sheep can't drink from fast waters. They, if, a, if a water is moving too fast, a sheep can't drink from it. Probably because they're going to get swept away because sheep are dumb. And so they'll get themselves into the water and poof, there goes your sheep down, down, downstream. And then you've got to leave the 99 and go look for the lost sheep that's been washed down the, the, the creek. Well, that, that's its own problem. Actually, that is a dumb thing about sheep as well, is, is that they also will follow blindly other sheep. That when, if, if um, Again, Ken Davis, in, in some of his illustrations, they said that the one day they lost 15 sheep because one went over a, a, a cliff and 14 other ones went right behind them. 15 sheep, they all died one day because they just, well, if he's doing it, must be okay. And go over the cliff they go. Doesn't that sound a whole lot like our society? Yeah, I wonder if that's okay. Oh, no, no, let's go try it anyway. And so uh, it says that in Scripture that we lack for nothing. God will provide everything that we need. Not everything we want, but God is going to give us everything we need. And he's going to provide a situation where we are going to be content Paul says this, you know, I have found the secret of being content. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It says as you're in relationship with Christ that he's going to provide everything you need. And so God is going to provide those things. It also says that uh, he will correct. Um, Blessed is the one whom God corrects, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty, for he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, but his hands also heal. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful later on. However, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Most of us don't like to have correction in our lives. No, most of us don't like to have God in this role, but that's one of the roles of the shepherd. 
Uh, probably many of you have heard the illustration, and, and uh, this is what a shepherd will do, particularly with a young lamb that has wandered off. Uh, he will find that lamb, and then he will break its leg. And then he will keep that lamb right near him so that he will begin to discern his voice and know what is safe and what is not, and he will learn the voice of the shepherd. And sometimes God needs to do things in our lives in order to be able to help us. And he's going to give us some difficult things so that in the midst of those difficulties, we will learn to trust him and lean not on our own understanding. God is going to do what is best for us. Not always what we think is best for us, because God is going to use things where we need to be corrected in order to get us to a place where he wants us to be. And so sometimes God wants us to see him as the great shepherd or the good shepherd who corrects us. But he also does this. He protects. Verses 4 and 6 of Psalm 23 say this, Even though I walk through the darkest of valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my, my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God protects us. He is always watching over us. Even though we walk through difficult circumstances, He is with us. His rod and His staff, they comfort us. And He will place us in situations where even though we are at a situation where we are in the presence of our enemies, it says that uh, He will uh, anoint our heads with oil and our cup overflows. Just a wonderful image of what God does in our lives and he, as He protects us. And so what do we see about the Good Shepherd? Well, as we move towards Easter, it's interesting to note that uh, it says that the Good Shepherd lays down His life for us. As we move towards Easter, we celebrate the fact. And so it's, it's interesting to know because we see the whole picture of this. But when you read in John 10, this is before Jesus has actually died. And so here Jesus is giving a hint to something that's going to be happening in the future. Like they would go, well, that's really great that the shepherd lays down his life. But we understand that that's an image of what he's going to do on our behalf. And as the good shepherd, he is going to lay down his life for us. That's what John 10, 11 says, that he's going to lay down his life for us. He goes on and says the exact same thing. And I lay my life down for the sheep. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it for me, but I lay it down all of my own accord. And so here Jesus is painting a picture in this image. He's looking forward to when the cross is going to happen. And he says... I think it's interesting that he even prophetically says, you know, I'm doing this of my own free will. You're going to think that other people are killing me, but they're not. I'm doing this of my own free will. He even hints in this illustration of his resurrection. He says, I lay it down only to take it up again. It's an image of what is going to be happening. It's an image of his death and then his resurrection. And that it's not going to be because evil men did all these things. It's because he's going to willingly lay his life down for you. It's the image that's there. So he lays down his life, but he also seeks us out. Jesus says in Luke 15, 4-6, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Jesus is seeking us out. You know, for some... Maybe you've never come to the point of making a decision to follow Jesus. Jesus is seeking you out. He's seeking you because if you're lost in your sin and your difficulties in life, 
He's seeking you out and he wants you to be found. And when you are found in the Good Shepherd, you find the things that you were missing in your life, his protection, his guidance, his protection, and, and, uh, and all these things that the Good Shepherd provides. Amen. Amen. The decision to follow Jesus is the, the single most important decision that you will ever make. And those who put their, what does scripture say? Those who put their hope in him will never be disappointed. Never be disappointed.